Hello, and welcome to the Evolved Man Masterclass. Today, I am super excited to have with me special guest, Stephen Palmer. How's it going, Stephen? I am well. How are you, Ben? I'm doing awesome. It's like to have you and talk to you uh, again for our second time. So, Stephen, you are a uh, authentic purpose coach and an author, and you help people come home to who they really are. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so... Uh, I call myself a purpose coach, but what people don't understand that I'm really technically an emotional healing coach because purpose is what you naturally do when you don't have any blocks or barriers in the way of it. And the biggest block is emotional wounds from the past. So we have people don't live their purpose because they're afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they've been hurt in the past. And always as children, before we have the cognitive ability to make sense of our pain. Right. And so from those deeply seated emotional wounds that, that come to us as children, we develop false and limiting beliefs about ourselves. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy of love. Nobody values what I have to offer. I'm not good enough. Whatever it happens to be, everyone has kind of their unique flavor of what I call the not enough wound. And right. so really... Um, as a purpose coach, my primary goal with most 90% of people I work with is to help them heal emotionally so that then they know they can get over the barrier of fear and then give what they have to offer freely to the world with an open heart and, and really give everything they have. All right. I'm going to play skeptic for a minute. Um, I'm a grown man. And I don't, you know, these childhood wounds don't affect me anymore. You know, I've moved, I've moved past that. Um, Prove me wrong. Um, do you ever stonewall with your wife? Um, sure. Do you, uh, do you get into conflicts with your wife? Um, I'd, say, I'd say more often we're, we're actually more of conflict avoidant than we are, um, you know, go head to head. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing. It's just a different style. Right. Um, do, you, uh, do you ever have situations where you get emotionally triggered where somebody will say or do something and you'll find a trigger in you and you won't really have conscious awareness of why it's bothering you? And sure. you'll go into defense, protective, defensive mode? Right. Uh, yes. And then I'm, I'm just going to, I'll turn off the skeptic in a moment. Uh, but isn't that everybody? Yes, because everybody has emotional wounds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Including um, and especially men. See, this topic is so, so vital for men in particular because we're, we're raised in a culture that says, boy, you know, men should be tough. Men don't cry. We're, we're taught to basically suppress our emotions. And that's taught to us in so many different ways. And we also have this kind of interest where men today are caught between a weird mix because on the one hand, we're taught don't cry, be tough, man up, suck it up. On the other hand, we're taught that we should be by women from the, from the feminist movement, um, uh, which th that we should be more emotionally sensitive and in tune. So it's like, which is it? You can't have both. All right, so um, that's kind of the dynamic that men find themselves caught between, and, and pretty much every man I've talked to can really relate to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know, especially with uh, a female relationship, it's like you need to have power because there there is a power dynamic in the relationship where they want you to, you know, be that force. Uh, on the other hand, you can't be too much of that, and you need to have um, the special tool set to understand how they think and um, how they're going to interpret what you say. It's like you need to have both if you're going to be a, you know, a quote evolved man. Yeah. And what I find the way that I put it, if I can speak kind of frankly, if a bit crassly, but I just, the simplest way to put it is I think that most men are either pricks or pussies. They're either okay. absolute jerks because they're trying to be macho man or they're pussies in the sense that they're passive, they're pushovers, they don't assert themselves. And so the, you know, what I would call the evolved man that you're looking for is to me in between those that it, a man who's able to be emotionally sensitive and vulnerable, but without being weak and passive, and who's able to assert his needs, but without being um, a, a, aggressive or, or, or overbearing. And 
um, the, the methodology that I teach uh, uh, everybody, but men in particular, is really useful in that regard in finding that kind of medium. All right. So uh, the, that methodology is the, the heartfelt methodology. Or heart, heart space. Yeah. Heart space. Sorry about that. Heart space. And before we, we dive into that, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the results that you've, have, you've had teaching that methodology? Yeah. So <clears throat> just a little bit of background on me. My story is that I, I was raised, in, I was number 11 of 13 children had a very abusive father, very dysfunctional family, and created a lot, a lot of pain for me. And, and I tend to be a very emotionally sensitive person anyway, but um, growing up in that, uh, so, so my whole life, I'm 41 years old, and my whole life has been trying to figure out how to deal with my pain because it's been so oppressive. It's caused a lot of depression in my life. It's caused a lot of uh, um, harmful emotional patterns where I, you know, I'm a big stonewaller uh, with my wife and, and it really kills her and it kills me doing it. And, and just all of those habitual subconscious patterns that we fall into as a way to, as children to deal with our pain. Right. That's been the story of my life, trying to figure that out. So I've had some very deep personal experiences with this methodology. The methodology came from my personal experience. Okay. And I started teaching it to um, one-on-one clients. And then uh, I was teaching every Friday at an addiction recovery center that was full of just men. And I, I had my own personal experience with this methodology, but I didn't realize how insanely helpful it was for everybody. I started going and every Friday I would start teaching heart space. And the first time I taught this, I'm in a room full of grown men within five minutes, the entire room is just sobbing as years of repressed pain come out as they're able to touch that pain in, in open hearted vulnerability. What comes out of that is, is so healing and cathartic to be able to acknowledge your pain and your wounds hold them in an open-hearted, tender, gentle compassion and self-care without shaming them, without suppressing it, without feeling like you're weak and helpless for crying, or even feeling weak and helpless, but being comfortable with that. Because that's the dynamic that most men struggle with is they don't want to feel weak and helpless. Nobody wants to feel weak and helpless. Right. And, um, and, and being vulnerable feels weak and helpless, which is why men in particular really resist vulnerability. But vulnerability with our wounds is the only way to ever heal from them. And, and so the reason why this is so vital to, I mean, it's vital to everybody, but for men in particular, um, almost, almost every man that, that I've ever talked to has just really has this kind of oppressive cloud over them. And it's things that they can't really put their finger on. They're not satisfied in their work. They're not satisfied in their relationships. They feel like they're not measuring up. They, and, and they just don't know what to do about it because they're right. not taught vulnerability. So my experience with the methodology has been absolute just breakthroughs. And it's really, really actually quite simple. But, but just having the self-awareness to do it is, is hard. So it's, it's been a phenomenal journey taking this to other people and, and men in particular have been um, experienced some really deep breakthroughs for us. So it's been really fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I think um, what, what's important to highlight is that um, we as humans and, and especially men are, um, you know, we, we hold things in this kind of um, dark shame shadow and um, we, you know, make a pact with ourselves to kind of lock it up and, and never let it out because if you do that, then you won't be loved or, you know, you'll be ridiculed beyond belief and that no one has um, the thoughts that you've had or has had this stuff happen to them that you've had and that will make you stand out from everyone else. And I think, uh, you know, doing that shadow work is is so important and shedding light on it. And that's where, you know, you can take the, the step out of it and then start to free yourself. So I think it's, you know, amazing work that you're doing. Yeah, and I, I, um, I, I don't want to be stereotypical or, or sexist or whatever, and I don't mean this to be offensive, but I think in general, I think this holds true, and I think most people would relate to this. 
Um, not true across the board, but in general, I think that women, when it comes to emotional pain, women tend to be more kind of open and dramatic about it, whereas men tend to just suppress, suppress, suppress. And, and, and that's why it's so key in, in learning how to become vulnerable with that and stop suppressing our pain is so, so key for men in particular. All right. So how do we do it, Stephen? So, all right, heart space. All of us are born, we come into this world as children, we're open-hearted, we're kind, we're compassionate. Our natural state is to be kind, compassionate, loving, open, trusting. When, when you see a child learn how to walk, uh, I always use that analogy, especially in context of me being a purpose coach. When it comes to living your purpose, right. you want to know how it works best, look at a child learning how to walk. A child learning how to walk, <clears throat> Um, gets up, falls, and just keeps getting up. It doesn't, it doesn't think I'm a loser for not being able to walk. It doesn't, it doesn't have those kind of processes. It's just, it's just playing with life in right. a very open-hearted, vulnerable way. Well, what ends up happening over time is we get hurt, typically from parents, not always parents, sometimes siblings or teachers or peers, whatever, but somehow, some way, as Ernest Hemingway put it, the world breaks everyone. We just get hurt. In my case, it was a, you know, a super abusive father. It was being, being lost in number 11 of 13 kids, never feeling like I had a voice, never feeling like anybody understood me. So my, my core, like deep, deep wounds are the feeling of being rejected, the feeling of be, being misunderstood, and the feeling of being weak and helpless. Right. Those are the things, if there's any situation in, in, in my adult life that will touch on those wounds, it's, a, it's big emotional triggers for me. And then what we end up doing is we create defensive mechanisms around those wounds to protect ourselves from being hurt. And, and what we do is we close off our hearts and we move into our heads. So I, I define heart space as an emotional state of open-hearted vulnerability where you're comfortable in a place of pain, fear, and discomfort, where okay. you don't run from pain, fear, and discomfort. You're able to stay with them without resistance and hold them in compassion. And, and the way that we run from them is we move into what I call headspace. So headspace, in contrast to heart space, is a close-hearted, numb, defensive mental state caused by resisting or running away from pain, fear, and discomfort. Right. So we get hurt. And then slowly over time, we close off our hearts, we start living from our heads. And that is a very defensive way to live. It's, it's, it's coming from the perspective where everybody's out to get us. The life is out to get us. Not out to serve us and help us, but out to get us. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think to that end, you know, I know for, for more years than I care to admit, uh, drugs and alcohol were the, were the numbing agent of choice to to yeah. not feel pain. And, uh, it, you know, for me, it was, it was getting to a point like around when I was 30, where that actually just didn't work anymore. It wasn't, wasn't an effective uh, coping mechanism anymore. Yeah. And there's no end to the amount of defense mo mechanisms out drugs, alcohol, uh, other addictions like pornography, gambling, whatever. Those are our kind of more obvious ones, but there's, there's a million and other, uh, not so obvious ones. Like I brought up stonewalling, for example, right. or, uh, road rage or being an aggressive personality or being a high achiever. See that that's what's funny about a lot of high achievers is we tend to in Western personal development culture, we tend to put high achievers on a pedestal. But in my work, I do a lot of very intimate work with high achievers. And I can promise you that most of them feel like frauds. And most of them are high achievers precisely because they're trying to feel fill that not enough wound in their in that, that hole in their souls that tells them they're not enough. So the, the very fact that they're high achievers is actually counterintuitively not a good thing because it's more evidence of them running from their pain. They're right. trying to cover up that vulnerability by, by saying, showing to the world, look at my accomplishments, look at my material success, look at the car I drive, look at the, the house that I live in, look at my bank account as evidence to say, see, I'm okay. When deep down, they feel just as broken as, as the rest of us. And they're on that, that not enough treadmill trying desperately to be enough. And those are all defense mechanisms. We all have them. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a, it's a distinction. I like to think about it as, as seeking uh, external validation, you know, in terms of like trying to, to get that love of a, of a parent or um, as opposed to having that, that internal validation from, from your intuition and knowing that you're living by what, what you want instead of somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so the reason why all of this is important is because what all of us want more than anything men included, is connection. We want human connection. And connection is that energy that exists between people when we feel seen, heard, acknowledged, validated, valued, loved unconditionally, accepted. That's the, the energy that we have when we're, when we're connected with each other. When I really see you, you see me, I see you, we get each other, we don't judge each other. Whatever mistakes we, we make, we see that through the eyes of compassion, not through the eyes of judgment. That's what we all want. We want to belong. We want to feel accepted. We want connection. Right. What ends up happening is as we connection is only found in heart space. It's only found in open hearted vulnerability. You cannot have connection in headspace. You can't. All conflict is in headspace. All lack of connection is in headspace. So the, I had an interesting experience at this addiction recovery center where I was talking about connection and I asked a room full of men, if, um, and we were having a connective moment and we all right. felt connected and I, and I, we identified that. And I said, how many of you have ever felt this connection with anybody in your life? Everyone said nothing. They had never felt it ever. Really? And is there a reason why we're driven to addiction? And then what we do is we have, we're driven to addiction because of pain then we shame ourselves for our addiction. Instead of understanding the truth of it, it's not because you're a bad, you don't turn to addiction because you're a bad person. You, you turn to addiction because you have unmet needs, deep unmet emotional needs and, and right. have awareness around how to heal them. So is it any wonder that there's so, so much addiction because there's so much pain and, and people just don't know how to deal with it. So the way that I put it is our ability to connect with others depends on our ability to connect with ourselves. And our ability to connect with ourselves depends entirely on our ability to connect with our pain. So if you want to learn how to connect with others, you have to learn how to connect with your pain. And that means going into heart space and finding those soft spots, those places of vulnerability, the things that, that really make you vulnerable to talk about, the things that hurt the most to say. That's where you find connection. So the entry point to heart space is vulnerability. It's hard to do, um, but there's, there's no other way to find connection. That's what we all want more than anything. So in other words, if I'm hearing what you're saying, uh, the, the shortcut to getting there is to go to our most painful, tender places that we're scared to talk about and, and, and go there. And that's the, the fast track to get there. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, so when you're sitting one on one or with a with a group of men, uh, do you do you ask them just that? You know, what what is that thing that you fear the most? Kind of sharing, or what does that look like? Um, yeah, first and foremost, any coaching client I'm going to, I, for, first of all, you got to know the code. The code is it, it's very simple. Everybody got hurt when they were a child. <laughs> it's that simple. So right. go to. So I'm always trying to find that place. So if if somebody in a marriage, for example. Um, Here's a common one. Um, a spouse, a, a husband will become very kind of critical or blaming of the wife and the wife therefore gets very, very resistant and she shuts down anytime he sends the message that it's her fault. And I'm saying this from experience. I'm thinking of a particular client right now. Anytime he says something that has the feel of it's your fault to her, right. he completely shuts down. And so my question for her was, who in your life when you were a child told you that it was your fault? Because that's what's happening. It's, it's triggering that original wound. Right. And the problem is, see, what happens when we're children, these, these wounds happen and we don't have the cognitive capacity to think through them in a very rational way. So they get buried in our subconscious mind and they sabotage our efforts all the time. We don't even know what's happening. Uh, so anybody can relate to the experience of, of somebody saying or doing something, you, you see, feel an emotional trigger, you react in anger, and you don't really even know why you're upset. The reason you don't know why is because that's buried in your subconscious. So you have to do a lot of 
digging, but knowing the code, knowing there's some childhood wound here that's causing this defense mechanism to arise. And I want to get past the defense mechanism and find the point of vulnerability because now we can connect. That, and that's what happens in marriage in particular is we, it, when you're in headspace, it's just butting heads. You're just right. arguing, arguing, arguing. You're fighting, fighting, fighting. You're stonewalling. But when you both move to that place of vulnerability and you're not, you stop blaming each other and now you're just open hearted, vulnerable. Now we can connect. Now we can connect in our pain. And, and this, you know, pain is the point of connection. It's the most universal ex uh, uh, human experience. And that's why it is the point of connection. You want to connect with other human beings, be vulnerable with your pain and sharing your pain with other people. And people can, you have an instant connection. You know, I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to have a large percentage of your audience watching this who can relate to being abused as a child right. and not knowing what to do about it. And the minute that I am vulnerable in sharing that, they're going to feel a connection with me because that's their experience. That's where, that's always, pain is always the, the point of connection. But as long as we're resisting pain in headspace and what we're really resisting when we're arguing with somebody else, we're not arguing with them. What we're doing is resisting our pain. We're resisting going into that vulnerability. And, and that's why it's so hard to do. We don't know how to be vulnerable and we're scared to death to be vulnerable. So since you've got awareness around this now, are you able to catch yourself, you know, when you, when you go into those places now, um, you know, let's say you're, you're interacting with your wife or you have like a trigger, are you able to be like a, a Jedi and be like, wait, I'm being triggered. I got to take a step back here. Yes. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm slowly over time learning. It's not something, it's, it's not like a, a magic pill or something that once you learn heart space that always and forever, you're, you're never going to have conflict, but at least gives you the tools to work through it. So, um, let me give you a really concrete example. Right. Um, there's a couple money phrases that you can use to move into heart space. Uh, one is, uh, and this comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a, a Buddhist, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Uh, the phrase is, dear one, I am suffering. Um, and that's a phrase that my wife and I use all the time because that's kind of our signal to say, I mean, it, dear one, I am suffering communicates a lot of things. Number one, it communicates, I love you. You are my dear one. Number two, um, I'm ready to be open hearted instead of fight with you. So what we typically do is if, if we clash, we'll usually kind of just move away. And then when, when one of us is ready, we'll text the other one. We'll say, dear one, I'm suffering. And then the other one person knows, okay, now we're ready to connect and have a conversation. So just the other day, here's an example. It's, it's kind of silly, but I think people will relate to it. Right. Um, so, um, my why I've always wanted a truck. I don't need a truck, but I want a truck. Right. I do canyoneering and you know, there, there are things I would use it for, but it's not like I really have this desperate need to have a truck. It's just, Hey, I want a truck. Well, uh, my wife has this funny thing where she thinks men with trucks, who don't need them are compensating. Right. So she always kind of ribs me about a little bit or, or, you know, so the other day we were driving in our car and my back was hurting. And I was like, that's one of the reasons I want a truck because my back won't hurt so much when I drive. And she started kind of mocking me about a truck going off and, and I got really triggered. Right. Well, immediately we knew this was one of those things we separated. It took me all the five minutes to recognize what was going on. I texted her dear when I'm suffering, she comes up to the room and this is the conversation we had. What I, re what I realized in processing in heart space was what that really triggered in me was when I was number 11 of 13 kids, growing up pretty poor, um, I never felt like my needs mattered. It felt like I, that, that just that, my needs didn't matter. Right. And that was the heart space in that situation for me. It had nothing to do with the truck. It had to do with a, a little boy, a tender-hearted little boy needing to know that his needs matter. Right. And, and, and by the way, I don't, in order to get that, I don't need a truck. Right. You, right. You get the, but because that's what typically happens in order to fill these voids in our heart, we tend to look, get external things and those can never fill that. So once I acknowledge that, then I can, and it has nothing to do with her. She wasn't hurting me. She wasn't doing anything to me, but I could say from a very just open hearted, non blaming space, Hey, that's just what's in me is it triggered that, that deep thing that said my needs don't matter. And I just need to know that my needs matter. Now all of a sudden she doesn't have any need to defend because I'm not attacking her. Right. 
Because that's what we do in Headspace. We attack each other, and then we just put up defensive barriers. Heartspace takes down all the defensive barriers. You stop blaming the other person, and you just realize this is my own pain that came from me. What I'm defending against isn't you. It's my pain. And when I can stop defending against my pain, I can stop fighting with you, and then we can just connect and really deeply understand each other at a very deep, intimate, emotional level. So that's just, that's just one example is, um, of, and that's a really quick, the methodology itself is five specific steps, and I don't know how deep you want to go into those or how much time we have to go into those, but, but that's the essence of it, is learning. Anytime you clash or anytime you get emotionally triggered, understand that underlying that, there's some vulnerability that right. comes from, from childhood wounds. And when you can find that, when you can explore that and, and stay with that without running from it and resisting it in headspace, then it gets healed. Because when you find it, then you, you, you hold that little boy with compassion. The whole, so, so vulnerability is the, is the doorway uh, that opens up heart space. And then self-compassion is what gives you the capacity to stay in heart space and to, to ultimately heal. And vulnerability and self-compassion are two things that we are flat out not taught in our culture and especially not for men. Yeah, no, we're, we're, definitely, not, we're definitely not programmed for it. So I'd, I'd love to get to a, a summary of what the five steps are. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need to go into them in great detail, but I do want to talk about what what does self compassion look like? I mean, you, you described yeah. it as you know being able to hold and um, you know care for your your wounded child. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how we can practice that? I mean, I, I view it as kind of a being able to uh, forgive ourselves, um, but but talk a little bit more about how we can practice that. Yeah, for sure. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that, um, there's always in the method, when I teach the methodology, there's always two sticking points. There are always two big hurdles that people struggle with. Um, one of them I won't get into right now. The second um, is how to actually do self-compassion. And it's so funny that we just, we don't know how to do that. But, um, and, and if I may, let me actually give you the how to do self-compassion in context of the methodology because I think it'll make more sense. Great. So, so just brief overview. The, method, the five steps of the methodology are, number one, separate suffering from pain. I'll talk a little bit about that. Two, take responsibility for your suffering. Three, trace your headspace symptoms back to original pain. Four, move into your pain by saying what's hardest to say, the thing that makes you cry. That's when you get into the vulnerability. And then step five is to hold your pain and self-compassion. So step one, separate suffering from pain. Um, what this means is when things happen to us, uh, they're painful. When my dad used to, to beat me with a belt, that was painful, physically painful, emotionally painful. But the real suffering of that has come from my stories around that. Daddy right. doesn't love me. I'm not worthy of love. No matter how hard I try, I'll never be good, en good enough. Whatever those stories look like, and we create the suffering. My dad didn't create the suffering. He created pain, but he didn't create suffering. I created the suffering. And right. that's why step two is taking response. First of all, when something happens, you recognize, okay, am I observing or am I interpreting? Is this suffering or is it pain? Then I can take responsibility for my suffering. I can realize I'm the one causing this suffering. And that is so empowering because now I have the power to change it. Because somebody else causes my suffering, I literally technically have no way of fixing that. There's nothing <laughs> I can do. If my suffering is caused by other people, what do we, what do, we do about that? We're just always and forever going to suffer. But if we cause our suffering, now if we're responsible, we have the power to change it. And yeah, we can rewrite that story. Yep. So first, and, and that's so critical because now, this, now I'm not blaming my father. I'm realizing, hey, I'm the one. Yep, he had, we had some painful experiences, and those hurt. But it's 20 years of suffering after the fact. That's on me. But that gives me the power to fix it. Right. So, with that, then you, so step three, then uh, you trace headspace symptoms. So headspace symptoms are um, defensiveness, uh, jealousy, anger, rage, um, just uh, any kind of closing off or reactivity or whatever. We find where those are and then we trace them back to the original pain. Depression is a big one, especially for men. Um, and then you follow the breadcrumbs of suffering back to the original pain. Really quick example of this. 
Um, I've always had a beef uh, with guys who, who ride like big, loud, burly, macho man motorcycles, Harley Davidson motorcycles, the really loud ones. Um, it, it's, it's always something that I just think is obnoxious and I judge them for it. Well, I'm sitting at a light the other day, not too long, a couple, few months ago, and there was a big Harley Davidson in front of me, really obnoxiously loud, and, I, and I'm judging him. Uh, and then, but, but the difference is this time is I caught myself judging him. And, and I, I have no idea who this guy is. For all I know, this guy could be the most tenderhearted, gentle, kind man I've ever met. Right. But I, I'm judging him as, you know, a big, uh, as, as a prick, essentially. Um, well, okay, I catch myself in that judgment. So that's a judgment. Judgments of others is one of the biggest points of headspace. Because always underlying our judgments of others is some form of hurt in us. So immediately in real time, I was able to trace that judgment, that headspace symptom of judgment back to the heart space, which is this. It was very simple. And it was so, once I was able to do that, it was so quick for me to do. Right. It is that the men who have hurt me the most in my life have been those kind of macho men. Okay. And so immediately, now it's no longer about the guy riding the motorcycle. And I don't have any beef with him now. Now I'm just with my little tender hearted little boy and me who's got hurt a lot by these kinds of men. But now I can just hold that in self-compassion without judging other people. It's not about anybody else. So you find that pain, and then you find the thing that, that hurts the most to say. And when you touch it, it always makes you cry. I have yet to work with, if I'm working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one and we really find it and we really touch it, it will make you cry. It will. Um, and it doesn't have to mean that you're you know in the fetal position sobbing your guts out or anything, but but you know, tears will come. And, and that's what, just that process alone is very cathartic. Right. So then, final step, once you've found that original pain, then you hold that in self-compassion. Um, as far as how to do self-compassion, um, the image that I always use is anybody who's, has, who's had a child, think of, holding your firstborn child in your arms. The first moment you held your firstborn child in your arms. Everybody right. remembers that moment. And you look down at it. For me, it was my, my daughter, Liberty. And I, to this day, as if it was yesterday, I remember looking down at that baby and you're just overwhelmed with such feelings of love and tenderness and protection. There's nothing you wouldn't do to protect this child. There's nothing you wouldn't do to make this child happy. You're just there for it. That's the, and you just, just that overwhelming love. That's exactly the energy that you want to bring to yourself. That's self-compassion. And I, and the phrase, um, the phrase that, uh, that I use also comes from Thich Nhat Hanh is dear one, I am here for you. Dear one, I am here for you. Anytime you're in that suffering mode, you want use the phrase dear one, I am here for you. So I, if, if I could just, just, you know, inject that into people's brains that phrase the to habitually because typically what we end up doing is we shame we suppress and we shame right and it's the equivalent of when we are acting out in headspace from our wounds shame is the equivalent of uh the the little five-year-old boy in you is 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 reacting from his pain and you go up to him and you shut him in his room and you lock the door and say, don't come out until you stop crying. That's what shame is. Right. Self-compassion is getting down on your knees and holding that little boy and saying, I'm here for you. I see you. I love you. Your needs matter. And whatever it is for you in that moment. Right. Um, and, and, I'll, I, and I think this will be, be useful. Um, there are... Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. There are, um, uh, there, there are five, uh, where did it go? There's five core human needs. What I have found is that, um, all, uh, oh, okay. Um, I've done work with a lot of people. I'm open to there being more, but in my experience, these are the kind of the four core human needs. We need to feel loved. We need to feel seen. We need to feel accepted. We need to feel whole and we need to feel safe. Okay. And once you know that, that becomes kind of a key because anytime you're in suffering mode, emotional reactivity, stonewalling, rage, 
um, feeling not enough, feeling shame, you can know that at the bottom of that is what's, what's causing the pain is always going to come down to one of five things. I don't feel loved. I don't feel seen. I don't feel accepted. I feel broken or I feel unsafe. And the needs are to feel loved, seen, accepted, whole, and, and safe. So once you know that, because the, the challenge with this methodology is because you're dealing with subconscious wounds. You don't know what's going on. Right. A lot of times we don't have specific memories. So we can try to dig deep and you won't find a specific memory. You just, and that's okay too. You don't need specific memories. You just need to know what's happening. So when you have that as a key, it's really useful when you have the capacity to dig deep and find specific memories or experiences and, and really figure out this is what was happening to me as a child. But when you can't do that, it's okay. You have that as a key to know in any given moment when I'm in headspace suffering, the problem is one of those five. I don't feel loved. I don't feel seen. I don't feel accepted. I feel broken. I feel unsafe. And, and then you just acknowledge that once you, once you acknowledge that, then you just, you hold it in self-compassion and you, if you don't feel seen, then the, the act of self-compassion is seeing yourself. So right. your self-compassion is giving yourself those needs. It's the, it's the act of giving yourself the needs. And at that point, you don't need them from other people. You're, you're recognizing that they're already within you. Nice. Um, I think that was a, that was an amazing overview right there. Thank you for that. And I think it's um, a really nice summation of, of, of the pain we experience, um, how to deal with it and, and how to uh, evolve. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, is, is there anything that we, I mean, I think that was, that was pretty thorough and, and, and took us on, on the right trajectory. Was there anything that we, that we missed along the way? You know, there's so, so much we could go into. I, I mean, I, I taught this as an all-day seminar, and, and I didn't even get through half of my slides in an all-day seminar. So there's lots we could go into, but I think that that's a solid overview. Uh, again, I would just say vulnerability and self-compassion. Vulnerability and self-compassion. That's what we need to find connection. And, and it's what men in general are least equipped to do, vulnerability and self-compassion. Yeah. If you want connection, you got to learn how to be vulnerable and then you, and, but, but the key to being vulnerable is self-compassion. That's what gives you the capacity to stay in, in a place of vulnerability. All right. Well, hopefully those two words can, can become an accepted part of the evolved male vocabulary. So, uh, more men can get out of their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I think just lastly, um, you know, I know you're, you're, we, we've talked about purpose before, and, and I think you alluded to this at the beginning. Um, this work allows you to um, unlock your purpose, right? Because you're no longer um, blocked and you can just be in touch with uh, who you are and, and take those stumbling steps like that walking child and, and, and deal with it that way, right? Yeah, exactly. This is all related to purpose because um, so many men are struggling in jobs that they don't like because they, for so many reasons, number one, they're just being responsible and they're, they're taking care of their families. But a lot of times it's social scripts. They, they feel like they have to do the, re, the responsible thing. And bigger than that, it's just the fear of stepping into your power and really being who you really are underneath all of the masks and the layers. Um, and so, so vulnerability is so key to living purpose because it means living purpose means bearing your whole heart and soul to the world and giving everything you have to the world, just giving, 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 but we can't give from a place of headspace because headspace is where we're all closed off. We have to, to live purpose. We have to open up because purpose is sharing who we are. So how can you share who you are if you're unwilling or unable to be vulnerable? Right? Yep. Yeah. It's uh, it's exciting. It's, it's scary. And, and it's what is going to really generate true leaders for, you know, all of the fun challenges we got to deal with in the world today. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Awesome. Well, I think it's a, it's a great place to, to land the plane. Um, any, where, where can people find you online? I'll include the link, but, and um, do you have a, a gift for our, our listeners today? I do, yeah. So my website is stephendpalmer.com, Stephen with a PH, middle initial D. Um, I had to get the middle initial D because there's some Stephen Palmer in 
England who has my, has stephenpalmer.com. So anyway, stephendpalmer.com, Stephen with a PH, middle initial D, but, but you'll have the link to the free gift. The free gift is a, um, it's a toolkit with the title, Stop Sabotaging Yourself and Live Your Authentic Purpose. It, there's three elements to it. There's a PDF guidebook, there's a 40 minute audio, and then there's an hour long video training. Um, all of them super relevant to what we've talked about. It's, there's a lot of content in there about learning how to heal the emotional wounds so that you can live your purpose. So um, yeah, the, the, the purpose toolkit um, with those three things. And uh, there you have it. All right. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you dropping knowledge. And I know the audience is going to get so much out of this. Uh, I know I did. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm familiar in this space, but I think uh, it, it's great coming from um, uh, an integrated man like you in such a succinct, but uh, real way. So I appreciate that. Thanks for having me, Ben. I really appreciate it.